I'm, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's good. Great, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really great to be here. I'm very excited to contribute to the meeting. Um, and look, really looking forward to it. Uh, the pointer is here? Yeah. Yes. Excellent, thank you. So um, I'm going to talk to you about today about um, escape behavior and present a mechanism for um, computing the decision of initiating escape from threat. And I'm going to start uh, by showing you a video of um, an animal escaping in the wild, uh, because I think it's a, it illustrates very well um, the complexity of the escape problem, the, the, um, the different processes that it goes through, uh, the computations that have to be in place for a successful escape to occur, and also the, the richness and the complexity uh, of uh, the behavior, which I think makes it a very um, interesting and powerful uh, model for, for systems neuroscience. So, uh, some of you might have seen uh, this, this video. It's from um, um, uh, Life on Earth 2, narrated by David Attenborough. And it shows a uh, marine iguana that has uh, just hatched, uh, and much to its misfortune, it has uh, hatched uh, in a place surrounded by snakes. Um, and so this video follows two and a half minutes uh, in the life of this creature. All right, move to the left. So, there are the snakes, and the, the iguana has clearly detected that uh, it is surrounded by snakes. It has figured out that uh, they're probably not uh, a good thing, so it's kind of standing still. Uh, and I can let David Attenborough narrate it for me. And that's what it's doing, it's just freezing to avoid detection. Um, and, but uh, pay attention that it's, it's, it's clearly very vigilant and uh, looking at the surroundings and monitoring the surroundings. And at some point, one of the snakes is going to get just a bit too close and it's, it's going to, to start running for it. All right, there we go. There, so that's, that's the process that we want to understand. The moment at which escape initiates, what triggers this? And the escape itself is very interesting. It's a very dynamic process. Uh, it requires a lot of sensory feedback. Uh, and the most interesting thing to note, notice about this is that this iguana is not running randomly. It's actually running towards the rocks. So it's a, it doesn't end here. <laughs> it, it's okay. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> and so it runs towards the rocks, and this is of course a very good idea because snakes are not very good at climbing rocks, and so this is indeed the best place to go. So it really illustrates the goal directness of, of, of this behavior. All right, very good. So, so hooray for the iguana. Um, so, uh, it, it's, I mean, it's mind blowing that this creature does this, um, you know, minutes after having hatched, and we're very interested in understanding um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the processes uh, behind the escape behavior. But for the purposes of this talk, I'd like to focus on, uh, on two, uh, two processes, the process of threat detection and escape decision and for the time being, just make the point that they are two different processes. So um, this, the, the iguana had clearly detected, it was very clear in the iguana video that uh, it detected the snake, um, and there was a very long uh, period be between um, initiating escape, and it detected the, the snake um, as threatening because it probably is born with some sort of snake receptor wired up to the, to the defensive system. But the point is that uh, escape is not a, um, a simple withdrawal effect like uh, uh, action, such as you moving your hand from something that burns, is actually a, pro uh, a process that involves uh, some, a variable period of, of deliberation. And um, so there's a deliberative process going on, and this is what we'd like to try to understand. Um, and there has been a lot of work done um, 
on escape behavior, mostly in field in a very, very large variety of species, uh, and it has identified a lot of the key variables that are important for modulating escape behavior. Uh, and many of them have to do with the cost of escaping. Escape has a cost, uh, it has the cost, the energetic cost of actually escaping, but also it, uh, it's not a good idea to just escape from anything because you lose opportunities, you lose mating opportunities, feeding opportunities. So there's a constant trade-off that has to be, that has to be um, done before deciding to initiate escape. And I'm, I'll show you a couple of examples. For example, reindeers during ma mating season uh, will delay their escape from threats uh, if they are in the presence of uh, mates or in the area where are, there are a lot of mates. Um, fish will also tolerate more threat if they're in the presence of food and many other animals, uh, especially if they're hungry. Uh, animal size, so there are other variables, like animal size, for example, is interesting. So in birds, birds that are very large take longer to take off, they, um, and so they will escape earlier in the, in the threat detection process. Uh, and reptiles, for example, will um, take into account very clearly the distance to refuge. So if they're very far away from the safe place, they'll get out of there quickly um, than if they're closer to, uh, to, to the refuge. So, so the computation of the, this decision to, to escape is potentially complex. It has to take into consideration several variables, but um, it can also uh, be um, simplified and maybe at this most simple level, we can consider that animals will escape if uh, simply the threat level reaches some sort of threshold. When the, when the individual deems that the threat is too high, it will escape. In the, in the case of the iguana, it was just the snake got a little bit too close and then, animal, and then the iguana escaped. And so this is what we'd like to understand and this is what I'll talk about today. How does the brain compute this threshold for initiating escape? And in mammals, there's very little known about this. Um, now, we, uh, we, we don't work with iguanas and snakes, we work with mice. And in mice, we, uh, we use uh, stimuli, sensory stimuli that are innately aversive um, to uh, evoke, to trigger escape responses. And we, we work mostly with two types of, um, of stimuli. Uh, uh, expanding dark spots projected from above that uh, mimic uh, an object in collision course or perhaps a predator coming from above. So this is a stimulus that has been used very widely in the literature uh, for, um, for many, many species and has been introduced to the mouse neuroscience community by Marcus Meister's group a couple of years ago. It's a very powerful stimulus. Uh, and we also use ultrasonic sweeps uh, that are in the frequency uh, of rat calls. Uh, rats are predators for mice and perhaps for this reason, these ultrasonic sweeps are also very powerful for uh, um, eliciting escape behaviors. Um, and I'll show you what a typical example, uh, a typical experiment looks like. This is uh, an arena that has a shelter at the end and a threat zone at the other. Um, the mouse is put in this arena for the first time. It uh, explores it freely. It finds the shelter voluntarily and then adopts it as a home base and then makes um, exploratory tri trips out. And this is um, done in closed loop so that when the animal enters the threat zone, with a certain probability, the sensory stimulus is presented. Um, and this is what it looks like. So you see that the stimulus evoked a very fast, very powerful escape response to the shelter, uh, despite the fact that this animal has actually never seen this, um, this expanding spot. And this is what we're going to use through, throughout the rest of the talk. Um, and I'm going to, at this point, just acknowledge the people who, who did all of this work. Um, Dom Evans, a PhD student, and Vanessa Stample, a postdoc in the lab, uh, led most of this work, and they're really two great, fantastic uh, uh, young scientists who work uh, not only incredibly hard, but also contributed a lot for the experimental design and to the int uh, intellectual thought process of the experiments, and I'm very grateful for them. Uh, and they've been helped by Jar Leffler, a postdoc, and Ruben Val, another PhD student. All right, so to, to investigate the mechanisms that uh, uh, underlie escape decisions, we developed a very simple assay where we vary the intensity of, of the threat stimulus here uh, by varying just the, the contrast as a means of changing the probability the animal perceives the, the, the stimulus as an actual threat. Uh, and what we're going to show here is an example video illustrating uh, the, so the same mouse exposed in consecutive trials to a high contrast, mid, and low contrast.
right? So I think what's very clear from here is that the, 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 reaction, the, the reaction time is very strongly modulated, and the lower the contrast, the, the, the longer the reaction time. So here we were presenting this, the, this top spot five stimuli. Uh, the, at the high contrast, animal escapes on the first spot, and the lower contrast escapes at the last spot. Um, and this is further quantified, shown here. For one mouse, these are traces of mouse speed uh, for a decreasing contrast, and you can see that escape happens, this, uh, you can see here by the peak, the escape uh, happens later and later. And also, you might have seen in these videos that the vigor of the actual response, the speed at which the animal escapes, is, is also lower for, low, for low contrast, and you can see this here. Uh, and this holds across mice, so these are uh, trials from different mice, each raster plots of, of speed. Uh, each line is a trial from different mice grouped by contrast from high to low and sorted by reaction time. Uh, and in addition to, to a gradual decrease, uh, prolongation of the reaction time, I hope what you can see here in these plots is that the, the spread of the reaction time increases as well. So the variance of the reaction time uh, increases. These reaction times are all very tight and these are very spreading. Uh, have a large variance, and this is exactly what you'd expect from uh, integration of, of noisy sensory evidence to, to, to form a decision. Uh, and so uh, in, this, in, um, in this assay, the, the behavior can be well described by chronometric and psychometric curves that, uh, have, that are qualitatively very similar to uh, many uh, decision-making tasks. So the reaction time uh, decreases as the contrast incre increases, and the probability of escaping uh, goes up. And the probability of escape is also, sorry, the, the vigor of the response, which here we quantify just as, as the maximum speed of the escape, is also um, modulated by, by the contrast. Now, we can model this, uh, in, we, can, we can describe this, uh, this curve in, using a, a very simple model uh, where um, we consider a threat variable, here T, that is increased by uh, evidence of, of, by sensory evidence of threat, which here we just model simply as the radius of the, of, of the spot scaled by, scaled by the contrast that decays with some time constant uh, <clears throat> and has some noise. And then we treat this threat level as a decision variable that is compared against the threshold. Uh, if um, the threat goes above a threshold, uh, the animal um, es uh, escapes. So it's a very um, simple form of an accumulation to bound model. Um, and it, indeed, it captures the, the data well. The lines here are feeds of the model to, to the data. Um, now, and I'm sure there are many other models that will describe the data equally or, or even better. Mainly, we use it as a framework for, for thinking about escape decisions and to isolate two, two critical components. There's a component of integration of threat evidence and then a thresholding process. Now, can we find in the RAIN circuits and mechanisms that implement these two computations. Now, there, there has been a great, great deal of work uh, on, on escape behaviors and defensive behaviors in general. And so at the outset, there are many circuits that um, uh, might be important and relevant for, for computing these uh, escape decisions. And so to probe which ones are critical uh, um, in these conditions, we uh, adopted a, a loss of function approach. Um, and for sake of time, I'm, I'm just going to focus on, on two circuits, which are the ones that we think are the most important ones, which are the superior equals and the paragonal way, uh, which together form part of what is known as the midbrain defensive system. And these two regions have been implicated uh, several times in the literature, uh, where it's, it's been important for, for defensive behaviors. The superior colicus uh, is, is very interesting. It receives direct retinal input. Uh, in the mouse, it actually receives 80% or more than 80% of the retinal cell synapse directly onto the colicus. And the medial part of the colicus represents the upper visual field. That in our case is very interesting because we're projecting these spots from above. So we focus on the medial part of the superior colicus. And, and uh, Peter Redgrave and Dean have actually uh, proposed uh, several years ago that the superior colicus this area of the colicus forms part of an alarm system that detects threats. 
Um, the cubicles, of course, has a very distinguished history on, on the computation of uh, orienting behaviors, saccades, and also accumulation of evidence in decision-making tasks that require orienting behaviors. The periactal gray is a very intriguing structure. Um, it's, it's huge. Um, it has a columnar organization. Um, it's involved in pretty much any behavior that you can think of. Um, and um, the, dorsal, the dorsal colon of the PG uh, is known to be to participate and to be recruited during active defense. Uh, and escape is a form of active defense, so we, we focus on the dorsal part of the periactal gray. So to perform our loss of function experiments, we use a, um, a chloride conducting channel adopsin uh, called iClock, developed a couple of years ago by Simon Riegert and uh, Thomas Ertner, uh, which in our hands works extremely well. So when you, when you uh, these are recordings from, uh, I think, superior cubicular neurons in a, an acute brain slice. And when we shine light, blue light, uh, the, uh, this causes a very dramatic reduction in, in the, the ability of the cell to fire. Um, and it works extremely well. Um, and we use it then in vivo. Um, so we express uh, eye clock in excitatory cells in the colliculus and in the periarticle gray. Uh, excitatory cells defined by the expression of big root two. Um, so we express the, the opsin and then we implant optic fibers and we run the animals through our behavioral assay while we activate um, the opsin to inhibit the target area. Now this is what um, expression of eye clock looks like in a paradigmal gray. Notice that the, the superior cubicles is clean and now we do the this is a video illustrating the result of the experiment. So this is the same mouse, four consecutive trials with the light on and only two of them. So light off, on, off, on. Right, and you can see that light on in the periodical array completely blocked the escape response and actually converted the defensive response into a freezing behavior. So the animals did react to the threat. They actually did a slight uh, step um, backwards and they froze, right? So it, now the same thing uh, in, the, in the deep medial superior colliculus. Now, you see that again, the animals fail to escape, but now they actually resume exploration very quickly. So they don't engage in freezing behavior, but they resume exploration immediately. Um, and these are, uh, again, different trials for um, interleaf trials for PEG and, uh, EPC, uh, and deep, uh, deep SC. And you can see red interleaved with blue, uh, so um, escape, no escape, escape, no escape. So both of these regions are necessary for the escape behavior, however, uh, when we block the dorsal PAG, we don't block a defensive response. We block selectively escape, but the animal still engages in the defensive behavior, which is freezing. So we switch, we switch the defensive behavior, which means that the track detecting mechanism is still intact, but we, the animal cannot initiate escape. However, when we do this for the superior colliculus, we block most forms of the defensive behavior. The animal does not engage in any def defensive behavior at all, suggesting that the link between threat and initiation of defensive behavior is messed up, or indeed the representation of threat itself, suggesting slightly different roles for the SC and the deep PAG. Now, what is it that these two regions are indeed doing uh, during, during escape behavior? And in order to figure that out, we did calcium imaging in freely moving mice, uh, expressing GCAM6S um, in these excitatory cells uh, in the deep SC or uh, um, dorsal PAG, so we express the virus and then we implant green lenses to gain optical access uh, to these relatively deep regions and then on experiment day we attach it to uh, a head-mounted microscope and ex um, put animals in our um, defensive behavioral assay. Now this is an example of um, a field of view in the deep SC uh, and the cell masks that we use uh, and uh, trials for each of these cells uh, sorry, a sing um, traces for all of these cells in a single trial. Uh, and hopefully you can see that there's uh, a fraction of cells that respond with signals uh, that are 
on, they have an onset close to the stimulus, and so the, the, the transient rises between the stimulus uh, and escape onset. Now, when we look at the periaxital gray, uh, this is the same type of example, the field of view, the cell masks, and you'll see again that their cells, they are active, but uh, they're mainly active when uh, the, the activity coincides with escape onset. So there's no, almost no activity between stimulus and the onset of escape. And this is more obvious here in these plots. These are raster plots representing the average activity of all cells in the two regions that responded um, um, with signals to the escape. And you can see that there's a very large fraction of cells in the, in the middle spherical nucleus uh, that have uh, increased activity before escape onset. So this has all been aligned to escape onset. However, in the paratitle gray, most of the cells, uh, the activity is locked to the initiation of escape. Um, and um, <clears throat> this is now represented also here in these kernel density plots. And if you look more carefully at single trials uh, of, of um, uh, repeated trials in, in the same neuron or, or different neurons in, in the colliculus, we see that we see cal the calcium signals gradually ramp up uh, until they reach escape onset. Whereas when we look at the same uh, in the dorsal periaxis to gray, uh, the onset of the signal is really locked to, to the initiation of escape. Now, to uh, figure out if the activity in these two regions was representing the presence of a threat stimulus or encoding the, 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 the escape outcome, uh, we separated trials by, tr by the trial outcome, escape or no escape, for the same stimulus intensity. Here, 98% um, uh, for high contrast stimulus. Uh, and what we see is that this uh, activity in the superior colliculus uh, is high regardless of uh, the trial outcome when compared to um, no stimulus, which is um, represented here by um, the dashed line. So this is an average profile across several uh, of view, um, and so the superior glucose encodes indeed the presence of a threat stimulus, but uh, the activity is also higher in threats uh, where the, when in sorry in trials where the animal has escaped. So in, it encodes it has a mixed representation of both the presence of the stimulus and the trial outcome. On the other hand, um, neurons in the periaxial gray are completely silent, silent if the animal does not escape and are only active exclusively when animals escape. So they perfectly represent the trial outcome. And um, this is shown here, um, quantified here in uh, ROC analysis. We can see that the activity in the dorsal periaxial gray is an almost perfect classifier of whether the animal has escaped or not. Uh, and the, the superior colliculus is, is all, it also does a pretty good job. And more importantly, because signals in the superior colliculus actually start rising before escape, escape onset, activity in the colliculus is predictive of whether the animal is going to escape or not. So uh, an ideal observer, by looking at the activity, the population activity in the superior colliculus would be able to predict above chance level whether the, uh, at about one second before the animal escapes, whether the animal is going to escape or not. Um, and in addition, uh, there's a correlation, a decent correlation, between the peak calcium activity and the vigor of the escape, so the speed of escape, which is much stronger for the periaxial gray than um, for the colliculus. So in the framework of our, of our very basic model, it's almost a toy model, really, uh, this suggests that, the study would suggest that the superior colliculus might be involved in the threat integration or threat accumula accumulation of threat evidence process, whereas the activity in the dorsal PZ represents um, the result of this threshold, the thresholding operation of, the, uh, of, of threat evidence. Now, if this is the case, we can make some predictions about the behavior that we should expect if we were to activate these populations directly. So if we were to activate directly neurons in the DPSC, uh, basically what we're doing is just injecting different amounts of activity below uh, that still has to be passed through this threshold. And so we should expect a behavior that is very similar to um, the behavior we observe with sensory stimulation. However, if we activate dorsal periaxial gray cells directly, we should very reliably evoke escape. So we tested these two predictions using uh, uh, optogenetic stimulation, so similar experimental design to the inhibition experiments, but this time with channel rhodopsin. Uh, 
and um, <coughs> the experiment is then activating uh, Charlotte, activating cells in the colicos or also peyag tool gray with brief wise pulses at some frequency. Um, and this is an example uh, of expression of the opsin in the colicos or the dorsal peyag tool gray. Uh, and an example movie of, of the activation of the two and what you can see is that activation triggers powerful escape. And this is just to show you that this works and we can evoke escape behavior that is directed to the shelter by activating these two populations in a way that is pretty much indistinguishable from, from, from triggering escape using uh, sensory stimuli. Now we do the real experiment, which is to gradually increase the intensity of the laser as a proxy, for, a proxy for increasing the number of cells that are activated. And what I'm showing here are several trials superimposed of, of, of the speed of the mouse upon optogenetic simulation. Uh, these flat lines basically mean that the animal didn't really escape and, as this, and these peaks are escape, uh, are escape responses. And hopefully what you can see here is that as the intensity of the laser increases, the fraction of trials that produce escape gradually increases. However, when we do this for the pyroactive tool gray, we have a jump from no escape to escape in 100% of the trials. So we have a very strong all or, all or none effect um, at, in the pyroactive tool gray. And this is quantified here in <coughs> plots of um, laser power versus escape probability. For the superior colicos, we have a gradual increase in the probability of escape that really resembles the psychometry that we get for changing the contrast of the, of the spot stimulus, where for the, whereas for the periactical gray, we have this all or none effect. Um, and so this is consistent with the idea that this activity that we're injecting directly in the SC is still being thresholded somewhere, uh, whereas the same is not true for the periactical gray. And in addition, there's a nice correlation decrease uh, of reaction time um, in the superior colicus, the more we activate the superior colicus, the shorter the reaction time, whereas for the periactical gray, the reaction times are uh, um, fast and much less variant with uh, dependent on the laser intensity. Um, and fine, in addition, there's a very strong correlation between activity in the periactical gray and the escape speed and uh, less strong correlation for ASC, which is very much in line with uh, the calcium in imaging data that I, that I just showed. So this, um, this model holds uh, um, after these optogenetic experiments. Um, and so what we wanted to do in the, in the last group of experiments was to, to check if the uh, superior colicos is indeed directly connecting and directly passing information to the periactical gray. Um, so the first thing we did to check this was to uh, do monosynaptic rabies tracing. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is a technique that allows labeling of all of the pre all presynaptic cells from a starting population of cells. Uh, the starting population of cells in our case are periactal gray neurons, labeled here in blue. This is a, a schematic of, of, of this experiment. And, we see, and the cells in magenta are, are cells in the SC that are presynaptic to uh, cells in the peri periactical gray. So you see there's lots of magenta cells that get labeled. Um, this plot here represents the proportion of cells. Um, so the radius of the circles is proportional to the, the amount of cells that project to a single periactical gray neuron. And so on average, there's about an 11 to one convergence ratio um, where uh, the majority of cells that are connected are in the deeper layers of the superior colicus and they also have uh, some sort of uh, vaguely columnar organization. Now, um, it seems that there is a connection, so what are the properties of this connection? And in order to test this, we uh, performed whole cell recordings in acute slices of the midbrain, uh, where we record from excitatory neurons in the periactical gray, and we express channel dopsin in uh, the superior colicus, and then we activate inputs from the superior colicus with full field uh, illumination. And we did, we find connections in uh, more than 60% of the cells. However, these connections are very weak and fail a lot. So these are several trials superimposed of, of, of light stimulation. And we see there's a very, uh, lo uh, several of the trials uh, don't result in, result in a synaptic event. There's a lot of failures. 
Um, and the failure rate is on the order of 20%, which is very high if you consider that this is full field illumination. We're activating all of the synaptic terminals in the slice that come from the SC to the periarctic to the neuron. Now, for if there are any synaptic physiologists in the audience, I will indulge you with uh, telling you that the direct quantal, the quantal contact calculated by the direct method is, uh, short, is less than two, and most importantly, uh, it matches the prediction from uh, a possible model of um, neurotransmitter release, which means that the release probability of these synapses is indeed extremely low. Now, a consequence of having a really crappy and reliable synapse is that it is very hard to make neurons in a periodical way fire from stimulation of the SC. And these are voltage traces of several, uh, repeated voltage traces of stimulation with a single light pulse. And you can see that all of the responses here are subthreshold. And we think this is an ideal mechanism for implementing a threshold at the synaptic level. Now, when we stimulate this repeatedly, we get lots of activity, uh, and the probability of spiking actually increases gradually with, with the light pulse number. And so we think that this is a really a good means for implementing a thresholding operation at the synaptic level. Now, how is it that the... Um, the, how is it that this threshold set by this synapse with a low release probability is overcome? And we think there are two mechanisms. The first mechanism is uh, presynaptic facilitation. So synapses with low release probability are known to facilitate. There's a temporary increase in strength uh, that these synapses display, which we think is important for integration to action potential thresholds. And the second one is, comes from this observation that if we give repeated light pulses, recording from one cell, we see a barrage of synaptic events that really outlasts the, the stimulation, suggesting that we've engaged some recurrent excitatory activity in this network. Uh, and in the slides, this, the, this actually takes about half a second to decay back to baseline. So this really suggests some recurrent network activation. Um, and to test where this recurrency might come from, we look at an activity between PEG cells and between SC cells, uh, and we find that there is some degree of connection between PEG cells, but the connections are weak and unreliable. Uh, however, when we do this for the deep SC, we find that 100% of the cells receive input from at least from other excitatory cells in the deep SC, and that they are strong and they are reliable. So we suggest, so this suggests that there is a network of recurrent excitatory cells, of excitatory cells we currently connected in the deep SC, which we think might be important for helping integrate um, to thresholds. Now, this mechanism, this synaptic mechanism for implementing a threshold only really works if cells in the deep SC have fairly low basal firing rates that then peak at around 10 to 40 hertz during the unit rest stimulation. And so to see if this was indeed the case, we made uh, measurements of firing rates in the SC, making uh, single unit recordings using silicon probes uh, in the deep SC. Um, we, this is done in head fixed awake mice where we present the threat stimulus. So we're just focusing here on the response of, this, of the units to the threat. Um, and we're very pleased to see that indeed this is the case. So this is an example from one unit. Um, um, the PSTH and uh, raster plot showing action potentials uh, for several trials. And uh, in response to, high, to a high contrast spot, this cell peaks at around 20 hertz. And, uh, and very nicely, if the contrast is halved, the, um, the firing rate also is halved, actually increases to around 10 hertz. Uh, and this holds uh, across about uh, 100 units that we have that we recorded. Um, so this is good because the means that the firing rates are indeed in the range that would exploit this me thresholding mechanism. Uh, and it was also interesting to see that in about 20% of, of the units, we saw uh, units that have um, elevated firing rate that persists long after the stimulus and takes a very long time to decay. So this is an example unit and this is a quantification for cells um, exposed to sound uh, decaying. So this is from the offset of the stimulus, and you see that it takes about, in this case, almost six seconds to decay back to baseline. So it's um, high 
long-lasting persistent activity that is in line with this idea that there might be a recurrent uh, a network of excitatory cells in the deep SC contributing to, to threat integration. And um, so this was actually done with neuropixels probes. Um, this is very high density, high channel count. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to show you a slide that seems uh, uh, with the help of, of Nick Simon, who's here in the audience, actually, we, we've um, been able to record uh, with animal freely moving. Uh, and it's, it's really cool. So um, the only thing I expected to get from this is we can, we can record from gazillions of channels while the animal is, is moving around. And the, the fun thing is that we can get in a single shank the whole of the SC, the PEG, some bit of the cortex below, and the MLR underneath. So it, it, it's going to be very exciting to really analyze all of this data and get the whole transformation in one go. Now, the final last experiment and the last piece of the puzzle is that I've showed you that the, the SC is important, is, in, is, to, is to prove that uh, this connection is indeed critical for computing the behavior. So I've showed you that the, the SC is necessary and that the PG is necessary, but the, the SC projects to many places and the PG receives input from many places. So it's certainly possible that these alternative projections might be the ones computing the behavior. So to to test this, we adopted the chemogenetic approach, where we exposed, expressed HM4D, which um, is a designer receptor that, when activated by CNO, uh, activates potassium channels and uh, leads to a decrease in excitability. Uh, and it's targeted to the synapse by fusion to norexin. So this is a tool developed by Scott Sternson. So we use this and we express HM4D norexin uh, in, in all synapses in the SC, and then we go and locally uh, Prefuse CNO only at the synapses at the PEG. And as a control, we do this in uh, alternative projections. And so this experiment is actually quite tricky. It almost killed Dom and Vanessa. So we, um, we express the, the constructs. We also express channel adopsin so that we can activate these projections also with channel adopsin. Uh, we then implant the fiber and then implant the cannula to, to locally prefuse CNO. Uh, in the PEG or in, in other areas. Uh, and then we expose the animal, we put the animal through our assay uh, and evoke escape using uh, either expanding spots or light stimulation in the presence of CNO. And so this tool works extremely well uh, in our hands. Uh, applying CNO to SC cells does not change their firing behavior, and this is critical, but yet it really shuts down the connection of the PEG to the PEG on average, it leads to about a 70% reduction. And so this is uh, a video illustrating the, this is the effect. Uh, the one that we care about is here. This is local inactivation of the SCPG connection. This is a control of the uh, blocking a projection from the SC to the lateral posterior nucleus of the thalamus that has been involved in defensive behavior before, mainly freezing. And this is a saline control for the, for the microinfusion. Right, and so here you have a very clear result. This animal did not escape, blocking, this P, blocking the SCPG escape, block, uh, the SCPG connection blocked the escape, whereas blocking an alternative projection didn't. Uh, and this holds across multiple trials, the very robust effect, um, and so it's quantified here. Blocking, local block of the SCPG connection actually leads to uh, almost complete abolition of the escape response, which is of similar magnitude of blocking all of the synapses using an IP injection of CNO. And this, this is definitely not the case for blocking um, another synapse. And we have done all of the controls for uh, unspecific effects of CNO. Uh, and these experiments were done with channel adoption stimulation. Uh, they also block um, escape responses to, to sensory stimulation. So the goal of this work in, as I told you in the beginning, was to identify mechanisms for computing escape decisions from, from threat evidence. And what we propose here is that uh, there is a network of excitatory cells in the superior colliculus that is important for integrating threat evidence. And this threat evidence is thresholded by a synapse uh, of very low release probability that when overcome by synaptic facilitation and this recurrency, causes uh, activity in the periactical way and this leads to escape initiation. Um, it's a very simple model. 
It's most definitely going to be more complicated than that, and hopefully it's not completely wrong. Uh, but I think it's a very good starting point for understanding the more complex computations that, that are important for, for driving escape behaviors. And I'll finish there, and again, thank you the wonderful people who, who did all this work and the funding that we received from the Wellcome Trust, the Gatsby Foundation, and uh, uh, the Medical Research Council. Thank you. There's, uh, I think, at least two mics standing, so if anybody would like questions, please approach a mic. Do you uh, observe freezing? Uh, correct. Uh, there was a little bit of freezing, if you want to notice. It's not as strong, uh, but we do. Uh, that's, and you're right, so this is what we would expect. Um, so if you see the guy in the middle, it, see, it's freezing, all right? And then eventually it resumes. It's not as strong, but it freezes. Hi, um, it's really striking that when you activate the dorsal PAG, you don't just get running, you get a directed escape towards the safe zone. And I'm wondering if you have any idea where the information about the safe location is stored. Yeah, that's exactly what we're investing a lot of effort trying to figure out. Uh, we don't know yet, so we're, we're uh, targeting all these candidates uh, from hippocampal uh, regions to cortical regions that project here, but uh, that's, that's really the, the, I agree that is the most fascinating aspect of, of, from, from this experiment. Yeah. Hi, over here. Uh, so two technical questions. The first one is I was curious how the head-mounted microscope were placed to visualize the intermediate and deep layers of SC. Do you have to get rid of some of the superficial layer, which might be important for this behavior? That was the first question. Uh, very, yes, we go through, we go through one side of of the, of, uh, to one of the sides of the colliquus, and so we do damage uh, part of the superficial and the intermediate. That's, that's a caveat of the experiment. The animals still, all of the animals still escape to the visual stimulus. That's the best we can do. Okay, second question is, it seems like a lot of the experiments are focused on the excitatory neurons in the SC. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering whether the SC projection, you know, there are garbage neurons that are projection neurons in SC, whether the, PAG projecting neurons in the SC are mostly excitatory, or there's also GABAergic neurons that project to PAG? There's also GABAergic neurons that project to the PAG. They project to inhibitory neurons in the PAG, and I think they form part of this inhibition loop that will act uh, in, in, in accordance to, to what I've shown here. So it, you're right, I completely skipped inhibition, but it was going to, it's going to act in parallel, and I think there is this, this inhibition coming from the SC. I see, thank you. Uh, I believe the escape response to a multiple stimulus presentation habituates. Correct. Is that so? That is so do you know what part of the circuit may habituate? It's upstream of this circuit. So um, I think, um, so I don't know where it comes from. So when we image after habituation, we don't see any signals in the SC. The signals in the SC are gone. Now it could be, it could be because it updated of, what, what habituated is whatever is upstream of the SC activating it, or it might be that something changed intrinsically in the SC that is responsible for that. We have looked and we have not detected any changes intrinsically in the SC. My best guess is, is upstream, but we don't know. Hi, very nice talk. Um, actually related to the previous question, so when you do a long-term kind of fear conditioning and you induce PTSD kinds of behaviors, you do see then this attenuation of the SC response, or do you think that maybe this, this passive coping, or this development of the passive, co passive coping mechanism might be in the, the synapse between superior colliculus and, yeah. and the perioculus? Yeah, that would be very nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's the, it goes two ways. If we, it habituates if we present intermediate contrast spots repeatedly, it, we can get extreme aversion uh, and, and, and fear conditioning. Uh, if we use high contrast spots. Uh, if we, and, and again, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, so if we image after a version, we, we see signals in the SC and signals in the PG, which are not distinguishable from, from just a, a standard escape response. So the animals then start, start escaping without stimulus. They escape from, from the place where they have been averted. So, so I don't know where it comes from. Um, I, I, when I, I went, I, we went to look exactly to, after the inhibituated animals, if there was any change in the synapse, we didn't really see anything. 
So I don't know, but I would love that to be the case, but Thanks. perhaps it's not. Pretty cool stuff. Um, my question is this. So um, in some sense, escaping is rewarding, right? But there are also, as you said, there are also other rewards in the environment. So can you give a sense of like how an escape response uh, competes with other rewards in the environment? Because some sense, escaping in that case can be costly if mm -hmm. there are better rewards in the environment. Um, and what are your thoughts? Is it like, is, is the activation of the PAG more like a particular parameter yeah. modulating those costs and benefits, or is it just a long on on escape no matter what? Yeah, so I think that's very interesting. And to, and to get to, that's, that's where we want to go, to get to the bottom of that and how, um, how things are. So we, I don't know, so for example, so we do a lot of experiments where, uh, that I'm not showing here, where, where we trade off food in, in food deprived animals with this. And when we do this, the probability of escape is severely reduced. And in that case, we can, we can actually reproduce that phenotype, a direct stimulation of the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus uh, that projects directly to the periactical gray. Uh, we haven't gone as far to showing that that is the direct connection that, that, that implements this. But in that case, so there's a lot of connectivity there providing a means for reward circuits, food circuits, thirst circuits to directly manipulate the activity in the PG. It could be from other, from other aspects, maybe it could go to the SC as well, but there's certainly the circuit is there to be able to implement all of that by, by, by changing at the, at, at the PAG level. But is it the same population, you think, in that case? Or? It, yes, it's the same, the same excitatory population, Viglutu neurons, for sure. They also receive input from the prefrontal cortex, for example, directly. Right, thanks, very cool. All right, last question. So I'm broadly, I'm broadly interested in learning and learning the dynamics of a circuit. So you have basically your, your two populations, and I imagine one is slowly ramping up, and then the second is basically exploding once the threshold is reached. But then the animals um, never see predators. So is there any learning? And could you comment on do these dynamics change over time? Yeah, so in the, in, in, in the naive animals, there's no learning because this is implemented. Uh, everything that I've showed you was, was in the most naive animal possible. Uh, there is learning, and I guess the form of learning is the one that has been referred to in terms of habituation or aversion. Uh, in, in the animal, animals will get either less responsive. We'll learn that the, st we'll learn that the stimulus actually is not followed by something bad, right? Because it, it never, nothing bad ever happens to them. Uh, and in this case, the, the activity goes down, but we don't, uh, we, don't, we don't have enough data on the dynamics of the system. And this is what we're exactly hoping to get with these larger density recordings to, 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 to get enough data to look at that. So I can't give you an answer on what dynamics actually change, but something changes for sure. Yeah. Maybe final, final question. How did they do the shots of the lizards in the movie, or is it a fake movie? It's a, oh God, so you can read all about it. And uh, apparently they got an award for that. Uh, and then there was some outrage that some parts of the, of the clip have actually been engineered. I mean, as you can imagine, it's not a straight sequence, right? Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, there was a lot of outrage with the BBC at some point, but I think most of it is real, really. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs>